Thank you. Okay, the next item of business is a statement by Keith Brown uh, on ministerial statement, the deaths of John Yu and the Mara Bell. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to make a statement on police call handling and the tragic deaths of John Yu and the Mara Bell in 2015. I would like to start by offering my condolences to the families of John Yule and Lamara Bell. The Chief Constable unreservedly apologised to John and Lamara's families yesterday, and as the then Justice Secretary did at the time, I want to apologise to the families for this tragic loss. I am deeply sorry. Following a complex and thorough investigation, the Lord Advocate, in her independent role as Head of the System of Prosecution in Scotland, confirmed that criminal proceedings would be brought against Police Scotland in connection with Mr Yule and Ms Bell's deaths. As members will be aware, on Tuesday at the High Court in Edinburgh, the Police Service of Scotland pled guilty to an offence contrary to the Health and Safety at Work Act, etc., 1974, admitting to corporate criminal liability in relation to these tragic events in July 2015. I understand that the case team and staff from the Crown Office, Victim Information and Advice Service have communicated with family members and their legal representatives throughout this process. President officer, I know that the minds of a number of family members will now turn to the question of whether there will be a fatal accident inquiry. This decision, as the Chamber will know, is a matter for the Lord Advocate, and I have no locus in it as Cabinet Secretary. I can say that the Lord Advocate has confirmed that work has begun to initiate a fatal accident inquiry and has committed to make further information on the process public when possible. It is important to recognise the significance of this case and of the sentence. However, as Lord Beckett said in his sentencing statement, there is no sentence this court can pass which reflects the inestimable value of life lost and harm caused. Following the tragic events in July 2015, ministers did act quickly, with the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice directing Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary to undertake an independent assurance review of the operations, systems and processes in place in Police Scotland's Contact, Command and Control Division. That review resulted in 30 recommendations for improvement, and the Inspectorate worked closely with Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to implement wide-ranging changes in the period since. In May 2018, HMICS published an update report which confirmed that all 30 of the recommendations relating to their initial assurance review had been discharged and commended Police Scotland for the considerable priority attached to this work. This week, HMICS published a further briefing note confirming that it has continued to engage with Police Scotland's Contact, Command and Control C3 division and conducted ongoing assurance work on the new contact assessment model and the wider Police Scotland change programme. The briefing note confirmed that a further eight recommendations were made to support ongoing improvement and to ensure that key areas of development and risk continue to be addressed by the SPA and by Police Scotland. All of these further recommendations have subsequently been discharged. HMI Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland Jill Emery commented in the briefing that she is, in her words, confident that Police Scotland has made significant progress in terms of its call handling processes and is committed to pursue continuous improvement, investing further in technology staff and the C3 estate. Mrs Emery noted that the force had maintained a high level of transparency over its call handling performance, publishing monthly reports on its website to ensure the public and interested parties can scrutinise its progress. She thanked the officers and staff of Police Scotland who have continued to engage positively in HMICS's assurance processes and reviews. 
Presiding officer, since the establishment of Police Scotland, public scrutiny of policing has never been greater. It is essential that public and parliamentary confidence in the police remain strong, and I know that members will share my view that Scotland is well served by its police service, its hard-working, dedicated and professional officers and staff. Created through the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act of 2012, Police Scotland is a result of the largest exercise in public service reform since devolution. The Justice Committee of this Parliament's post-legislative scrutiny report on the Act was published in 2019, and it rightly recognised some significant achievements, including the creation of national capabilities in policing, described as, in their words, a success story for Scotland. And we are confident that the structures and procedures brought in under the Police and Fire Reform Act of 2012 have strengthened the governance, accountability and scrutiny arrangements for policing. In giving evidence to the Justice Committee, and notwithstanding, of course, the circumstances of this tragedy, in October, as part of that process, Chief Constable Ian Livingston was clear that police reform has made Scotland safer, saying, I don't think Scotland will be as safe now and in the future as it is, had we not gone through that process of reform. That is a sentiment which the Scottish Police Authority Chair strongly agreed with, and in these recent unprecedented times, we have been very well served by Police Scotland, its officers and staff. Public confidence in policing is high. A survey of the Scottish Police Authority in February 2021 confirmed that 58 per cent of respondents rated their local police as excellent or good. Publishing its recent annual report on 13 August 2021, HM Chief Inspector of Constabulary, Ms Jill Emery, QPM, said in the context of an ongoing pandemic that having one police service for Scotland helped achieve consistency in leadership, direction, interpretation and implementation of legislation. Police Scotland's public messages repeatedly emphasised working with the public as fellow citizens, maintaining the principle of policing by consent and building legitimacy, despite the extraordinary additional police powers to restrict people's individual freedoms. Much has been achieved through police reform, and I firmly believe that policing in Scotland is stronger for it. That, however, of course, in no way detracts from the failures that occurred in this part of the reform programme and which have been accepted by Police Scotland. As Lord Beckett stated during sentencing, the offence for which police, the Police Service of Scotland has accepted responsibility and pled guilty to arises from human error which arose at a time of considerable restructuring of the police and necessary reorganisation of their procedures. I accept Senior Counsel's unchallenged submission in relation to the reorganisation of call handling and area control that this was not changed for the sake of change or change driven purely by the desire to reduce costs. Rather, the lack of an integrated system caused considerable operational difficulties. The previous legacy systems could not communicate with each other. Access to technology across the forces varied, and coordination of operational responses across legacy boundaries was convoluted and cumbersome. The Scottish Police Authority recognised that the severity and significance of the charges and the fine placed on Police Scotland underline the serious failure to respond appropriately to this incident in 2015. SBA Chair Martin Evans said in the statement following the court proceedings, the Chief Constable's detailed acknowledgement of these failings, apology and personal commitment to continue to drive improvement and further reduce the opportunity for such circumstances to ever happen again are frank and heartfelt. Uh, Presiding officer, nothing I say here today in the Chamber can adequately recognise the sense of grief and loss, grief and loss that the families will have uh, endured. But again, I want to turn to the families of John and Lamara and say I am deeply sorry for what happened. I am deeply sorry for your loss. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. And it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call Jamie Green. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement? Presiding also, the deaths of Lamar Bell and John Ewell are an utter tragedy. There really are no other words for it. But this is a tragedy which should not have happened. It resulted in unimaginable horror and, as we now know, the avoidable death of Lamar. It is also a tragedy which many warned might happen. This case laid bare some very difficult truths for the Scottish Government which it too must be held accountable and responsible for, over and above the apology that we have heard today. 
It is clear that the centralisation of Police Scotland and specifically its co-handling practices undoubtedly led to a period of funding concerns, IT problems and operational failures which ultimately cost the lives of two innocent people. The government cannot absolve itself of all responsibility and only a fatal accident inquiry will unearth these failings. Cabinet Secretary, much was made in the statement today about lessons learned, which of course they must be. So why is it the case that as recently as June of this year, some 40% of calls to 101 police were abandoned by the caller because of lengthy waiting times? Is that a lesson learned? And on police funding, does the Scottish Government contest Police Scotland's defence argument in this case that the force's budget has been operating on a hand-to-mouth basis, so much so that the judge handed down a reduced fine out of concern for police's budget. And finally, may I ask, does the Scottish Government have any regrets of its own, which, through their admission, might ensure that a tragedy like this never, ever happens again? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, Jamie Green for his questions? Uh, I should say, first of all, that um, going back to uh, the comments made during sentencing, it was clear that the uh, uh, Lord Presiding said that this was the change that was happening at this time, the public reform change, was a necessary change. And he alluded to, as well, the inadequacies of the previous legacy systems that were there. And I can attest to that myself as a member of a police board. The eight systems that were there were not talking to each other in the way that they should. And, of course, the part of the public sector reform that was undertaken was to address this and many other uh, systems. And it was a necessary change. That was the point that the, uh, His Lordship made. He also mentioned, of course, uh, Jamie Green said that um, these were warned about. But, of course, the single point of failure was a human error, as was said by the Lord uh, uh, delivering his sentence. So, Human error, I think, uh, as was also said elsewhere in the judgment, is something that's going to happen in very large, complex organisations. I think that much, is, that much is, is given, but we have to work to try and reduce that. And I think the 30 recommendations which have been taken forward and the subsequent eight recommendations which have been taken forward, specifically in relation to the call handling and management system, are our way and the police's way and the SPA's way of responding to that and making sure uh, the likelihood of that happening again is absolutely minimised. And I think the comments made by the inspectorate, which of course is the body which oversees these changes are very encouraging to say that we are the police ourselves and the SPA are getting this uh, right. There's a fundamental reform happened in terms of how these calls are handled. They take over two million calls a year. And calls can drop out for any number of reasons. People can get drop out because they're directed to go elsewhere. There can be any number of reasons for that. And I think what happened in the previous legacy systems was calls were often not answered at all. And there was no record kept of the fact that those calls weren't answered. And that doesn't happen now. On the point that uh, the member makes about budgeting, I would say that we have increased police funding year on year since 2016-17. Uh, investing more than £10 billion over that time. Of course, the decade that we're talking about from 2011 to 2021 has been a decade of austerity, and it's against that background we've seen an increased policing budget from £75.5 million more to over £1.3 billion. And, of course, during that entire time, had a higher number of police officers than any previous administration. There are no doubt there are budgeting uh, pressures. I, I would concede that, and that's set by the context in which we ourselves are funded. But we'd point out just as recently as last year, the budget that we're currently working under, we allocated £60 million extra to the police. The Conservatives asked for £50 million. We allocated £60 million and have on occasion allocated further funds for specific purposes, for example, body-worn cameras. So, yes, we are looking to learn these lessons, and we do want to maximise uh, the budget for the police. We've committed in this Parliament to uh, maintaining the police resource grant right through the Parliament, and I hope we'll have support. But, yes, we are, of course, learning lessons, and the bulk of those, I think, have been taken forward in the recommendations, the 30 recommendations, which have been followed by eight subsequent recommendations, all of which have been discharged by except that's got to be a continuous process. Thank you. Call Pauline McNeill. Scottish Labour would like to add our voices to that of the Cabinet Secretary and offer condolences to the families of John Newell and Alamara Bell. There were many troubling factors leading to the death of these two young people, and lessons must be learned from these huge mistakes in this case. And the fact that it took six years for the family to finally have a court confirm that the feelings of Police Scotland and an admission of corporate criminal liability. The Cabinet Secretary initiated an apology. I would ask what deeper reflections does the Cabinet Secretary have 
in ensuring that this cannot happen again, that all steps are taken. It is clear that failures to accompany centralisation of Police Scotland with adequate staffing and training we know was a factor, because in the various reports, the officer who took the call, who stepped in due to staff shortages, was not a trained telephone operator, and he did not even have access to the IT systems, a monumental complete systems failure. A properly resourced 101 call centre with well-trained staff is obviously crucial, and we have heard that 71,000 calls, 40 per cent of those 71,000 calls, were left unanswered. I do acknowledge that confidence of Police Scotland remains high, but I ask the Cabinet Secretary, with that in mind, is he really satisfied that Police Scotland has the necessary resources it needs to ensure this can never happen again? And when the fatal accident inquiry proceeds, how can we ensure that it's done speedily and that the public see that justice is done and that accountability is given? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Paula McNeill for her questions and just address the last question that she asked first of all. Of course, and I know, I know she knows this, we have no control over the pace of the um, FAI if that's the way the Lord Advocate chooses to proceed. And I would also acknowledge her first point, which was about the time it's taken to get to this stage. I acknowledge the delay and the... Uh, uh, the angst that causes to the people involved in that. But once again, we have uh, the government quite rightly no control over that process. I think, though, it is welcome that Lord Advocate has said that she has started the process already and that she will keep us updated as to how that uh, moves forward. Uh, I, I, the member asked as well, are we uh, satisfied that the resources um, are available to the police in a sufficient quantum? And I would just refer to my previous answer. We have consistently increased the police budget. I think we've responded to when there have been, and there have not been that many requests from opposition parties and budget processes to increase funding to the police, which can only be done at the expense of other services. You do have to make that choice. And we've also responded to the police for specific requests. We're also hoping to make sure that uh, our police remain in much larger numbers. So I would point out that one of the budget constraints is if we increase our police numbers, as we've done, to over 17,000, and if the UK then reduces its by 17,000, that means that they are spending less on policing and we get less in terms of consequentials. So it becomes harder to continue to fund what we already have in terms of the numbers of police. But I do think that the commitment... First of all, to make sure that we maintain the police resource budget there is a very strong commitment in this Parliament and should give some, I would hope, uh, reassurance uh, to that. And I would hope that would be uh, supported by other members. And, of course, beyond that, it is the government's responsibility to allocate funding. It is the Parliament's responsibility to agree that funding. It is then the SPA's responsibility to uh, deal with that funding and oversee how the police expend their budget. So, and I, from my point of view, I have... Uh, rising and high confidence in the ability of the SPA uh, to do that. And we do have to learn lessons. I think it will take a bit of time to do that, and it will also be something which is done as and when and if an FAI proceeds. Of course, we should learn lessons at that stage as well. I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Colette Stevenson. I know Lamar's family, and I am thinking of them today, and I have uh, for many days over the last six years. Uh, for the Justice Secretary, though, to use this week of all weeks to claim the centralisation of the police was a success story, I think is both insulting and offensive, especially as the Chief Constable admitted that for three years the call centre system was unsafe. Four months before the tragic death of Lamara and John, I warned Nicola Sturgeon about the problems at the Bilston Glen call centre but the government did nothing to stop the Cavalier closures. Political decisions have consequences. So will the Cabinet Secretary follow the dignified lead of the Chief Constable and accept that they got this police centralisation programme wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I appreciate the points that Willie Rennie makes and also the fact that he has been involved in this case for a long time and his personal uh, knowledge of the family concern. But I have to say I disagree. I have been a supporter by conviction of the centralisation of the police force. I believe it leads to a better police force in Scotland and it is showing already benefits. I, of course, acknowledge in this case the tragic loss of life that's happened to you, but I believe it's a fundamentally important uh, public service reform. And it wasn't just me saying that. I read in my statement all the different people, whether it's the Chief Constable, the Chair of the SPA, or the Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, all have seen benefits from centralisation. 
So I do think that's a very important point to make. And I think also uh, Willie Rennie will, uh, has asked about what lessons we can learn. Now, I've mentioned some of those things already. I've mentioned some of the practical things which have been done. Paul McNeill mentioned increased training and so on for staff, and that's been taken forward as part of the 30 recommendations. I do have confidence those recommendations are improving even further the service which is there now. But it will be the case, uh, and Willie Rennie may well have the chance to contribute to that, that the FEI, if that's the way the Lord Advocate proceeds, will give us a further opportunity to look back and learn further lessons during that process. And I, for one, would uh, commit, of course, the Scottish Government to play a full part in that process if that's what happens. Collect Stevenson to be followed by Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. And my thoughts and heartfelt condolences go to the families of Lamara and John also. Can the Cabinet Secretary reiterate some of the actions that have been implemented by Police Scotland? following the HMICS Independent Assurance Review to ensure that a tragic and avoidable event like this never happens again. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I thank Colette Stevenson for her question? And just to point out, of course, that the HMICS Independent Assurance Review did not examine the circumstances of this incident, but instead provided wider independent assurance of the operation, the systems and processes in place within police contact, command and control, what's called C3 facilities across Scotland. I mentioned that there were 30 key recommendations made um, in 2018. HMICS provided an update on the progress which had been made. It wasn't simply being left either to Police Scotland or even to the SPA, but it was also um, inspected by the con uh, Inspector of Constabulary. Uh, and they made a further recommendations, and they have confirmed that all eight of those recommendations have now been closed. And for those that have taken the time and have the experience of reading the Inspectorate's recommendations, these are not soft recommendations. They are very serious and delivered by people very expert in this area. It noted, for example, that considerable priority and effort had been applied to ensure progress had been made, uh, that the management and staff of C3 Division have continued to be strongly committed, that they now have a single national command and control system in place, which, in their words, allows oversight of all incidents across Scotland from any of the three area control rooms or service overview functions, and that provides resilience, more effective management of national incidents, as well as providing a complete picture of activity and I've mentioned previously the IT legacy systems, substantial work has been undertaken to further stabilise the ICT infrastructure and systems and provide an effective medium term environment. So I'm very grateful to the inspectorate for the work that they've done and that gives us confidence that and as far as is conceivably possible we drive down any risk that something similar could happen again in future. Russell Finlay to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tens of millions of pounds in compensation for the Crown Office's malicious prosecution scandal won't come from their operational budget. Ministers have promised that these payouts will come from other public funds. It's reported that Police Scotland may face similar claims over their criminal negligence in the M9 tragedy. Will the Scottish Government today make the same commitment and guarantee that not a single penny will be taken from frontline policing Budgets. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say that these two uh, examples given uh, by Mr Finlay are not comparable at all? We are not at that stage. It is not open to me to comment on any potential further cases that come forward. But you can assume from the approach taken by the Scottish Government and to the other case that you mentioned that we do not want to see the police budget impacted. And I have mentioned already that we want to safeguard the resource budget for the police. But as I say, none of those things are areas of the, the potential actions which the Scottish Government is involved in or informed about, so I wouldn't want to say more than that at this stage. Thank you. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Court noted that operational difficulties at the time included differences in access to technology across the forces. Has the Scottish Government taken any action to ensure that Police Scotland now have access to up-to-date and sufficient technological resources? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Rowan Mackay for her question? I think I've mentioned that in response to the previous um, answer, uh, previous question from Colette Stevenson, that yes, there have been substantial upgrades, um, and that has been a huge problem. And I would say, quite candidly, that's not true across all the IT systems which the police rely upon. It requires substantial investment, and anybody that's been aware or involved in public or even sometimes private sector procurement of IT systems for very large organisations knows how complex this can be. But in relation to this particular area of work, uh, I am confident that the work has been taken forward. And it's confidence not just 
deriving from an assurance from the police themselves, serious though that would be, it's also the assurances that we receive both from the SBA, who again this month will hold in September another public session on this very area itself, but also from the inspectorate, as I mentioned previously. So those things do provide a very strong level of reassurance. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. Poor implementation of central control centres was the underlying fault behind this tragic death and the police have rightly apologised. But capital funding of Police Scotland per police officer has remained around the fourth lowest across United Kingdom police forces since the creation of the force, and around half of the police services uh, assessment of what they require. So will the Cabinet Secretary reflect and extend his apology to police officers for his government's failure to fund the systems, facilities and equipment that was required to create a single police force? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to uh, the member that um, I mentioned already the fact that we have spent extra money on the police right throughout the last 10 years when public finances have been extremely um, squeezed over that period. I think everybody, uh, especially the member, acknowledges that fact. And he mentions capital funding. We've maintained capital funding and as well as the capital allocations that we've given them, none of which I think were challenged by any other party in this chamber, we have given additional capital funding for specific purposes when that's been requested. I've mentioned body-worn cameras, but other things as well. So we do remain alive to the request from the police, but it is all one pot of public money, notwithstanding the difference between resources and capital. And you have to make choices in relation to this. We've chosen to have a higher number of police officers, to pay our police officers better, and to provide the equipment I've mentioned already. So, there's always a debate about this, I acknowledge it, and maybe the member has a different view on how they should be dispersed. I accept that point, but I think we stand by the allocation of resources that we've made to the police, and we'll try to continue to maintain that right through this Parliament. Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Scottish Government have any plans in respect of police recruitment to ensure that all areas of the service, such as call handling, are sufficiently staffed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, can I thank the member for her question, uh, and she will know far better than me, in fact, that um, recruitment for the police is, uh, of course, a matter for the police. Um, the Scottish Government, though, has continued reform funding for a further year uh, to support police transformation in £29.6 million. Reform funding will be provided to the SBA this year to support a range of transformation projects. So, in relation to recruitment, that will remain, uh, as it is just now, a, a question uh, for the police. But they, uh, as you would expect, are watching these proceedings. You'll have heard the member ask that question, and I'm sure that will be taken on board. And we will continue to support both the um, current police numbers that we see, which, of course, are uh, higher than any previous administration. Uh, and I'm also pleased to report to the member, again, she may know this anyway, that there's very strong interest continuing to join the police, a contrast with, for example, the armed forces, where there's been substantial recruitment crises in previous years. So that assures me that the... Um, uh, work in terms of recruitment uh, and I acknowledge there are a number of members in the chamber that have written to me in recent months about aspects of recruitment that the work that's done there uh, will be taken forward both by the Police Scotland and the SPA and, that, and as far as it relates to reform of the service uh, we will continue to support that at the same time as providing the support that I think we're duty bound uh, to provide uh, the police in our public statements given the fantastic role they played not least in the last 18 months during the pandemic. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you. My heart goes out to the family and friends of Lamar Bell and John Newell. No one should have to experience such an avoidable tragedy. This terrible case reminds us that serious harm and death can be the result of not only individual mistakes, but of institutional and corporate failures, failures of governance and of care. While Police Scotland's admission of breaching health and safety legislation, its convic conviction and the imposition of a small fine bear some symbolic significance, they do little to bring about real justice. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the people of Scotland urgently need law reform, which would effectively address corporate and institutional responsibility for death and serious injury, and which would do so through robust, participatory and potentially transformative processes? Cabinet Secretary. I think what I say to the member, um, 
just now at this stage of the Parliament is that uh, I, I know her views on the issue that she's raised. Uh, I would say that from my point of view, I am confident in the justice systems that we have. Uh, we have seen, notwithstanding the point that Polly McNeill raised earlier on about the time it takes sometimes to get to a conclusion, and it can be a time which is very difficult for people waiting to find that resolution to the issues of justice which they seek. But I have confidence in the justice system. But of course, uh, we will, as a listening government, listen to proposals for further changes which we could uh, look at in order to facilitate the more efficient use of um, the justice system to achieve justice. That is something we should always uh, seek to do. I am happy to engage with the member, as I have done already, a bit, uh, further in due course on the issue that she raises. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and add my voice to the heartfelt sympathy expressed to those affected by the tragic deaths of Lamara and John. I am encouraged that following today's announcement, questions which have remained unanswered may be explored further with a fatal accident inquiry. However, we must also consider the feelings of those left behind. The loss to the family is ongoing. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary about the range of victim support processes in place for them? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Michelle Thompson for what is a very important question about the uh, victims in all, in all of this. Uh, I should say, of course, for the family and friends left behind, no sentence can adequately address the tragedy and loss that they have experienced. But I do note that the Crown had been in regular contact with the families during this difficult period. Uh, the Chief Constable, as well as writing with a full apology to the family, has offered to meet with the families. That, of course, will be a decision for the families. I uh, have letters being compiled just now to write to the families as well. So they have received that support through the Crown Office and elsewhere. And once again, our sympathies are with those families. Dean Lockhart to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The move to a centralised call handling system has inevitably resulted in significant gaps in local knowledge and a disconnect between Police Scotland and local communities. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that a return to a more localised, knowledge-based call handling system would help prevent similar tragedies happening in the future? Cabinet Secretary. I, I don't want to dismiss out of hand the suggestion that the member makes. Uh, when he talked about, started to talk about a more decentralised system, I thought he was going to mean in terms of accountability and some kind of influence over uh, local policing. And I think that is something we should explore further. I would, I would concede that point. But I don't agree with them on the issue of the National Call Handling um, uh, Centre. I think what's happening now, that it's been improved to the extent it has, is the best system that we could have. And I think when we did have the eight legacy systems, the inability to talk to each other, or even cross-boundary issues, were problematic. So I think we do have the better system. We have to make sure it's the best system it can be, or accept that. But going forward, I'm more than happy to engage the member on the issue, which I know he's raised before, and certainly his party has, about more local influence and control over how the policing system operates. And Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Scottish Government have any plans in respect to financial support for the continued process of police integration and reform? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank the member for his uh, question? See, I have sought to answer that with some of the funding I have uh, announced that we will continue to um, commit to Police Scotland for that process of reform. And it underlines the point that we, of course, recognise that reform did not end in 2012. Uh, and it takes time to go uh, through a reform of that size. I think it has been described as the biggest public sector reform under devolution. So I think we have to accept we have got to continue uh, to support that. I have mentioned already that the Chief Constable has uh, been candid about the fact that there are still challenges in terms of some IT systems and other systems, not in relation to the call handling specifically, but across uh, the legacy forces and legacy systems that they've had. So I think given that, we are duty-bound, and given the vital nature of policing to the well-being of the entire country, I think we are duty-bound to continue supporting that in the way I've described and with the resources, even the very recent resources that I've described in my earlier answer. Thank you. That concludes the ministerial statement on the deaths of John Yule and Lamara Bell.